Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention. Thank you again. Thank you for joining us and thank you to everyone watching uh, on the live stream. Uh, my name is Ian Whitaker. I'm the Director for, St for Strategic Content at the Chicago Council. Um, before we begin the program, a few quick housekeeping points. Uh, we are on the record today. We're live streaming the program. We welcome your social media engagement, but please silence your phones before we begin. Uh, and please know that views expressed by the individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand. We'll also have questions coming in through our our application, you just type ccga.live into your directly into your browser. Uh, there should be the, the link on the screens as well. Um, with that, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today. Uh, Zani Mintimidoz has been editor in chief of The Economist since 2015. Previously, she was the business affairs editor responsible for the newspaper's coverage of business, finance, and science. Uh, she's also been the economics editor and emerging markets correspondent. Uh, Zani has written extensively about, uh, about international financial issues, including uh, enlargement of the European Union, the future of the International Monetary Fund, and economic reform in emerging economies. Uh, prior to The Economist, Zani spent two years as an economist at the IMF uh, and worked as an advisor to Poland's Minister of Finance. Uh, Zani will be in conversation today with Brian Hansen, Brian is the Vice President for Studies at the Chicago Council, uh, where he oversees the Council's research and hosts our weekly podcast, Deep Dish. Uh, Zani just recorded a, an episode of that, so you can check that out next week or maybe later this week. Um, prior to joining the Council, Brian taught courses on international relations and international development at Northwestern University and also built the Buffett Institute for Global Studies at Northwestern. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Zani and Brian to the stage. So thank you so much for being here and thank all of you for coming. Um, you know, there's a certain irony in this discussion right now because in a sense we're back to where it all started in Chicago. Because what we've been told by the British government at the time is the decision to have a referendum on, on Brexit was made in a pizza restaurant at O'Hare International it's Airport. It's your pizza. That's what caused it. Chicago deep dish pizza. <laughs> Um, but literally, as they were flying back from the NATO summit in 2012, the final uh, decision was made. So we are deeply implicated in all of this. So the question is, do you think it was a good pizza or a bad pizza? <laughs> well, that's what I'm going to ask you, as a matter of fact. Um, and since the referendum, you know, three and a half years passed, something like 1,200 days, um, lots has happened. Two prime ministers have resigned uh, in the EU treaty. Obviously, Article 50, which is the exit provision, has been triggered. Um, but still, after all that time and after all that pizza, uh, the UK remains a member of the EU, um, and at least till the end of this month and possibly beyond. Of course, um, this conversation is not only about uh, contemporary events in Brexit itself, uh, but the reshaping of, of politics in Great Britain um, as, as well. So, uh, and, and not only Britain, but has long-term long implications for Europe, as well as our relationship with the UK. Um, so we're so happy to have you here to clarify um, all of these issues for us. <laughs> Um, given um, given um, how obvious the answers are. Uh, and just to emphasize what Ian says, I'm going to save about 20 minutes for questions and answers for, for you. So uh, you can be thinking of what you really, want to, you really want to know. I want to start with a really simple, straightforward question. Why is Brexit so hard? <laughs> well, I have to start by saying that I'm sure it was not the pizza, because, you know, <laughs> Chicago pizza I'm actually a great fan of, having spent uh, several decades, and most of my adult life in this country, um, and I'd forgotten that the, the, the fateful decision was, was taken at O'Hare Airport. Um, why is it so hard? It is hard for several reasons, but the simple one um, is that since we joined the EU in the early 70s, um, you know, that has been the sort of fundamental integration, the basis for the fundamental integration of our economies, of our legal system. We're entwined with the EU economically and have been for decades, thanks to the creation of the European single market, which the British championed and were the great driver for creating. British manufacturing is incredibly integrated. Our economies are integrated. Since the enlargement of the European Union, we had a huge number of people come from other countries. We're just very, very integrated. So it's like, 
It's like having a divorce after several decades of marriage where, and it's, it's much harder than that, you're just fundamentally integrated. So that's one reason that it's just a difficult thing to do. The second is that the decision to leave the European Union, the referendum, um, mixed two fundamental elements of democracy. You know, Britain is a representative democracy. Parliamentary sovereignty is what is, is, is the way our system functions. Parliament is sovereign. But on that fate, fateful pizza night here, they decided to outsource the decision to direct democracy. And the reason they did it, and this is very clear even in, in David Cameron's recent memoirs, was to excise or try to excise something that had riven the Tory party for decades. There has been an element within the British Conservative Party that has never been at peace with Britain being part of the European Union. And they've been very agitating about this, but it was something within the Tory party. And, and you know, they were known as, David Cameron called them the nutters. You know, they were people, sort of more than a fringe element, but it was a fight within the Tory party. It was not something that most Britons really focused much on. And in fact, before the referendum, if you look at opinion polls on what are the most important issues facing Britain, membership of the European Union was nowhere near the top. It was just not something that anybody focused on. But in order to sort of excise this from the Tory party, they decided to have a referendum, pretty confident that they would win it. I mean, that was the sort of prevailing view that it would be won. It happened at that time to then be a vehicle through which a very large um, disgruntled group of Britons could exercise a protest vote. And this was this is the, el the area where there are real elements of parallel with the, U with the last US presidential election. There were a lot of people who turned out to vote who were just really angry. And they hadn't thought, I don't think they'd spent an enormous amount of time thinking about the details of Britain's membership of the EU, but the European Union became the sort of bogeyman for them of their frustrations. And, and certainly elements, you know, immigration was part of it, but it was basically a kind of, we've not been listened to and we want to be listened to now and we're angry. And that's, that's really why it was won. But during the campaign, they had been promised you know, you could have your cake and eat it. You could leave the European Union, but nothing would really change. Life would get better. It wouldn't cost anything. There was no downside. These fantastical promises were made. You know, the bus that was driven around with promises of 350 million pounds that would come back, that would then be spent on hospitals. And if you promise free lunches, if you say there's, you know, you can have your cake and eat it, and, and then you suddenly have to deliver, you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, it's actually quite hard to extricate this country um, and you haven't really had an honest conversation with the electorate about this is going to involve trade-offs. You don't want to be in the EU? Okay, we cannot be in the EU, but it is going to have economic consequences and the country will be poorer off as a result. But no one had had that conversation. And because we're uh, ultimately a representative democracy, it then fell to Parliament to, or the government to negotiate a deal and Parliament to approve it. Theresa May did negotiate a withdrawal agreement excuse me, I'm just getting a cold. Um, she negotiated a withdrawal agreement, but Parliament then has been unable to pass it. Three times Parliament voted down the deal that she negotiated because extremes on, the, on one side said, this is, you know, this is far too, we're not extricated enough, we're still part of it. Other side said, this is much too you know, damaging to the economy. There hadn't been a debate before the referendum on where we were going to. It was just the kind of, we don't like where we are. And so, you know, when reality bites and you have to make these trade-offs, it becomes very hard. So now we're in this utter, I mean, it's a combination of a sort of quagmire and a psychodrama. I mean, it's a quagmire because it's really hard to work out how to get out. It's a psychodrama because it's completely dominating and, and driving Britain somewhat crazy, actually. And, and, you know, we are, we have a reputation, somewhat deserved, I think, um, for being a country that is run reasonably sensibly by reasonable, sensible people who know how to you know, run democracies um, or organize and lead. And, and our system is being shaken to its very core by this. Lots to unpack there. Where I'd like to go next is to help us understand in a big picture kind of where this moment is. Some of the elements that we know about uh, are that the EU has given a, a, an extension till the end of October, the end of this month, and the Prime Minister Boris Johnson said, we're leaving one way or another, we're crashing out or another. Parliament has said, wait a minute, 
Uh, you can't do that. If you don't have an agreement by the 19th, there's going to be, you have to ask for, for an extension. Just Wednesday of this week, uh, Boris put a proposal forward of a new modified proposal uh, for uh, trying to negotiate the way out of the, the European Union. Walk us through this month and kind of these decision points and how to think about Kind of these key choices. Gosh, this is this is right in the, next in the weeds 20 days. of it. Okay, so this is this is the the sort of the detailed guide for the season junkie. There we go. Okay. Well, at All a right, high I'll, level. I'll try. At I'll try. Um, well, let me. I will do that, but let me do it with a sort of you know precursor of anybody who tells you they can predict what's going to happen has no idea what they're talking about. It, <laughs> it is. We just simply don't know what's going to happen. But let me sort of talk you through a sort of decision tree, if you will. So you're right. We've had several extensions, and now the latest one has October 31st. Fittingly, Halloween is the uh, uh, date upon which we are due to leave. That was the one that Theresa May uh, agreed to with the European unions. And just, I'm sure you all know this, but the default is that we leave, and not, in order not to leave, we have to ask for another extension, and the 27 members of the European Union all have to unanimously agree to grant it. So this is, we, we both we have to ask for it and they all have to say yes. Otherwise we crash out. That's the default option on, on the 31st. Um, Boris Johnson, the prime minister, came to, came to office. Remember, he was, he was not elected in any general election. He was elected in a leadership contest, voted in by 124,000, to put it somewhat simply, septuagenarian white guys. Um, but, you know, <laughs> He, he, he has come in on, on, uh, and he came in and said, you know, the deal that Theresa May negotiated, which had three times failed to get through Parliament, is dead, can't possibly have that. We have to ditch the Irish backstop, which is part of the deal that everybody hated. And I will get a fantastic deal with Brussels, but if I can't, um, we're going to go full steam ahead and prepare to, to, to leave on the 31st. We'll leave on the 31st, you know, do or die. You've seen this stuff. He said he'd rather die in a ditch than not leave. On the 31st. Lots of you know, bravado. It has to, 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 you know, to be fair, it has worked within his party. He's immensely popular within his party. Um, and actually in the country, people see him as decisive, knowing where he wants to go and so forth. So this, this bravura uh, to a point has worked. The problem is that Parliament um, thought that this was an insane um, way of approaching things. And uh, a few weeks ago, voted um, to prevent that from happening. And a bill was passed thanks to the defection of some 20 Tory MPs who were subsequently uh, lost the whip, which effectively means thrown out of the party, but they defected. They're called the rebel force now in a wonderful sort of Star Wars. <laughs> so the rebel force voted um, against the government. As a result, this bill was passed, which instructs the government to if it has not concluded a, a deal with the European Union, to ask for an extension. Um, so under British law now, if there is no deal agreed by the 18th of October, Parliament has to ask for an extension. So the, the, the decision point one between sort of now and, and the 18th is can Boris Johnson do a deal with the European Union? And you're right, he came up last week or earlier this week with um, the first sort of concrete plan that he would want to replace the withdrawal agreement. And this, and I, I mean, we can go into the, the absolute details, but basically this has a very complicated arrangement for Ireland, which involves a regulatory border between the island of Ireland and the mainland Britain, and a customs border between Northern and Southern Ireland, but not actually on the border, but checks away from the border. Not entirely clear how this will work, but that, that's the sort of basic elements of it. The bigger picture is that he seems to have got his party behind him. So I think he actually would be able to get that deal through the House of Commons. However, the Europeans, and particularly the Irish, but also broadly the Europeans have, have, have reacted very coolly to this um, because it is a deal that, that does essentially undermine the commitment to not having a border in Ireland. And that was a, an integral part of the Good Friday Agreement, which you know, ended the Irish troubles. So the Europeans have been very cool to it. Question, will Boris move further? Will the Europeans negotiate? Is there some basis for a deal there? If there is, it'll get through, the, and it gets through the Houses of Parliament, then we leave on October 31st. I, I 
I think that is less, well under 50% odds, but I think it is a possibility. So don't discount that. It's possible that there is an agreement at the last minute it, and, and we leave. If, it, if, however, there is no agreement, um, then the law kicks in, this law that, that, that has just been passed. And you know, the prime minister is instructed by law to ask for an extension. However, he has said he would rather be in a ditch than do that. So does he defy the law? Does he find a way of obeying the law but not really asking for an extension? And this is the sort of parlour game in London right now. You know, can they find a way around the law? Is this law watertight? Can they convince one of the 27 European Union members to say no to an extension? That way, they will have obeyed the law, but we will still be crash out. Um, the EU is fed up with us, absolutely fed up with us, understandably but also does not want to be blamed for Britain crashing out. So once there's, there's an awful lot of blame avoidance going on. So I suspect that they would allow an extension and enormous pressure would be put on any member who was thinking of vetoing it. So that then gets us to the 31st um, and we then don't crash out and an extension is asked for, um, probably until January the 31st. And then the question is what, does, what happens in that time? And the expectation will be that there has to be some democratic event. Something in, in Britain has to happen to try and resolve this conundrum. And there are two things that could happen. One is we could have an election. The second is we could have a government of national unity, which has one, one goal, which is to call for a second referendum. And the reason that's a possibility is that this gets very complicated, but we now have a fixed term parliament act, which means that we're only supposed to have elections every five years. And in order to call an election earlier than that, two thirds of MPs have to vote in favor for it. So basically the Labour Party can prevent there being an election. Now you'd think, why would an opposition party want to not have an election? Well, if they're doing as badly as they currently are in the polls, they might actually not want to have an election. So they might instead, say they have no vote, have a call a vote of no confidence in Boris Johnson as prime minister, create a government of national unity whose sole purpose is to have a second referendum. That's one path. Um, not sure how, you know, what probability I assign to it, but it's, it's certainly conceivable. The other, which is certainly what Boris Johnson clearly wants, is that an election is called. And that that election is, uh, you know, the Tory party will campaign on get Brexit done and hope to prevail over the other parties where Labour, no one's quite clear what it's standing for. The Lib Dems, the third party, are very much the Remainer party. And the Tories would, would hope essentially to clean up, get a big majority, and then we would leave either on their terms or with no deal. And there, the, the, that's possible. If they can clean up all of the, if they can basically take the votes that the Brexit party is now getting, it is conceivable that after an election, Boris Johnson could have a, a, an outright majority. And I think then we will just leave and we will leave on hard terms or we will crash out. But it is also possible. And if you look at where the, the parties are in the polls, that we have an election and we end up exactly where we are now, with the Tories as the biggest party, but without a majority and so unable to push something through Parliament. So you could have an extension an election and be exactly back where you are now, which is why everybody in Europe is just kind of throwing their hands in the air saying this is completely, you know, what, what can we do to end this? I can imagine that uh, some people are feeling that way also in the UK. We've been yeah. after this three and a half years, there's no majority in, in Parliament. Um, to what extent are the folks just, you know, fed up and say, we need to get out of this one way or another because there are other things we need to move to and we're just tired talking about this. Is that driving politics at all? No, a lot. A lot of people feel that. Um, I think actually, frankly, everybody feels that. Uh, it is, um, it, it's, it's meant that nothing else has been discussed, nothing else has been done. There is no British policy on anything other than this. So it's incredibly corrosive. But I worry that it's, there is a, a view out there that, you know, rather that people talk about the um, sort of, you know, band-aid approach. Let's just crash out, get the pain over, get it done, put it behind us. The problem is that even if we do that, even if we crash out, even if we endure the, you know, short-term dislocations, which there are bound to be, and even if we say it's fine, we can, 
um, you know, live with the medium term consequences. It's not all over because we can't, crashing out of the EU doesn't change geography. And we are just off the coast of continental Europe. Europe, the rest of the European Union is our biggest trading partner. It will remain our biggest trading partner. We therefore need to come to some kind of trading arrangements. And so we can flounce out of the thing and say, we've left, we're not paying you the money we owe you. But we're still going to have to come back and negotiate some kind of legal arrangements for this incredibly integrated economy that we've built up over the past few decades. So much as it pains me to say it, whatever happens, Brexit is not over in, in, as, from playing a sort of central part in British, British politics. And that's something that I think most people haven't really sort of focused on. I think there is a, lo a, a view that, God, let's get this thing over. We've had enough of it. Now, what we have to find a way out of is this sort of paralysis and stasis, which is why we've argued that the, there is no good way out of this, but the least bad way out is to have a second referendum. Um, because we cause this mess in large part by mixing direct and representative democracy. And the result of the referendum split both of the main parties down the middle. It's therefore very, very hard for an election, which is a parliamentary election, to solve it. Go back and have another referendum, and you will at least get an answer to the question whether three years on people want to go. Now, the counter to that, and I take this very seriously, is that there are people who say that will test the fabric of British society because it will be seen by a huge number of people as not respecting the result of the first one. Just, you know, if you don't like the result of the first one, you're just going to go back and ask people again and again. And that's, that's a fundamental affront to the British voter. And, there's a, and this has become part of the debate about, you know, the establishment is trying to prevent this from happening. And Boris Johnson is very successfully uh, channeling that. He calls the the bill that will force an extension, the surrender bill. He talks about you know, the people versus the politicians, the people versus the establishment. And he, he will, in an election campaign, play that card very hard. And he's good at it. So we've talked about scenarios that are all exit scenarios, either crashing out or negotiating the way out. In that context, do you see the possibility that the UK would stay in the European Union? Or is that a done deal and it's just a matter of the terms on which it exits? No, I think nothing is a done deal. I do think it's possible. I think if we had a second referendum, it would be, um, uh, it's perfectly possible that we would vote to stay. Even then, I think that now there is, it's such a, um, sort of boil on, in, in, I can't try to think of the medical metaphor, but so, it's such a h huge um, shock to the British system that there will be lots of recriminations after a second referendum. But yes, I think it's perfectly possible. Um, but it isn't going to then go, oh, right, okay, fine, we're staying, it's all over. I mean, the, the, the schism is very, very deep. And it's, you know, this has become, uh, for many people, the most defining issue for them politically. And it's, it's extraordinary. You know, Three, four years ago, no one cared about it. It wasn't anywhere near the top five of people's priorities. Now people define themselves much more by whether they are a Brexiter or a Remainer than whether they are a Labour Party supporter or a Tory Party supporter. And there was a, there was a poll quite recently, and I'm, I, think, I think these numbers are right, but they're broad, broad ballpark right, where something like 35% of Remainer voters said they would be either unhappy or very unhappy if someone in their family got together with a Brexiter. I mean, this is this has riven the country. So it's 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 so it's completely bizarre. It's something that no one thought about very much five years ago, and it's now the defining. You know, you the first thing you ask, and and maybe you do it too when you meet someone British. You know, you you, you want to find out which side of the you know are you a Remainer or are you a Brexiter. So let me pursue that a little bit. Um, what does this mean for British politics in the long term? Because you've talked about how this issue cleaves across both, um, both parties. And you know, most of us who follow British politics, it's a two-party system with this third, minor third party kind of dancing around from time to time. But it's basically labor and conservative. What's this mean for the, the future of how politics is organized in Britain? Well, I think it's actually an, an interesting and open question now whether we will continue to be in this Labour and Conservative with the third party, as you say, dancing around. Because if you look at the, that's certainly traditionally been the case. In the last election, over 80% of voters voted either Labour or Conservative. So overwhelmingly a two-party system. And that two-party system is reinforced by our system of voting of first past the post, 
um, which, which reinforces the strength of the two-party system. But when you get um, support for those parties declining and support for insurgent parties rising, uh, and remember now we, we have the Lib Dems in third place, but we also have the Brexit party. And I'm, I'm going to get these, these percentages shift around a bit, but it's approximately low 30s for the 32, 33, 34 for the Tories, 24% or so for Labour, 22, 23 for the Lib Dems, and 15% for the Brexit party. That is very different from the over 80% for two parties. And so at that level, you can get very big changes coming in an electoral map. You know, you could see a surge in seats for the Lib Dems, you'd see a collapse in seats for the Labour Party. We can, we, you know, it will be, if we have an election in the next few months, it will be one of the most exciting elections because it will be really unclear where this ends up. Um, and so I slightly challenge the idea that the two-party system, it could be just a sort of one-off shock and then the two-party system reasserts itself. But right now, it's really up in the air. So we could see the beginning of a much broader realignment in British politics. And the reason, which is sort of an added factor on this, which I think is something that we haven't talked about yet, but is also important, is this is happening at a time, and the Tory party is becoming a sort of more of a populist nationalist party. It's happening at a time when the Labour Party um, then this happened before the referendum, but is, is continued, ha has gone to the sort of far left extremes that we have never seen since really the 30s. I mean, and if the Labour Party was in a different position and was the sort of, you know, the Labour Party of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, British politics would look very, very different. But right now we have, on the one hand, a Tory party that's become much more sort of populist nationalist and a Labour Party that is you know, far, far, far left, run by, a, essentially by a Marxist, and certainly with a cabal of Marxists around him. And so that's a, you know, for the, the, for the centrist voter, whether it's a centrist Labour person or a centrist Tory person, the kind of, the broad centre has, has, you know, has lost its place in either of the two main political parties. And so that's a, an added complexity. Yeah. And, you know, we've had people on this stage who've pointed out that this is not just simply happening in Britain, but this erosion for the of support for the traditional parties, the rise of populist parties um, on the, and, and, and uh, more extreme parties on the left and the right is happening throughout the Western world. Do you see what's going on in Britain as part of something more broad and more systemic going on in the, in the advanced industrialized world, in the Western world, or is Britain really its own thing? <laughs> no, I do. I think that it is, um, if you look across Western democracies, you can see very strong parallels um, in lots of different places. And you know, let's, let's take this country. There are really striking parallels um, between what's happening, and it's it's not just. And I'm sure you saw our cover of last week where we had President Trump and and Boris Johnson as as Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Um, but you, you, they are there are huge similarities um, uh, in between the U.S. and the U.K. But it's not just there. There are you know the, if you look in continental Europe, the dominance of the traditional sort of centre right and centre left parties is fracturing. If you look at what happened in France, you know Emmanuel Macron kind of came out and was successful because of the, the demise of the traditional party structure. Um, so we're seeing that across, we're seeing a, a big shakeup. And I think that that's not a coincidence. I mean, there are individual idiosyncratic things in different places, but there are, I think the fact that this is happening in so many places at the same time suggests to me that there are deeper factors at work. And I, I let me give you sort of three big things that I think are going on across the globe which are sort of fostering this. One is um, that we're in the midst of a, or probably actually closer to the beginning than the middle of a profound technological revolution. The whole computer AI revolution is as big or indeed bigger than the last industrial revolution. And it is changing the nature of work, it's changing the possibilities and prospects for people, particularly people with less skills. It's making people feel very anxious about what the 21st century economy is going to be like. That's, and the whole question of you know, wage stagnation, all of that stuff, I think, element emanates from that. Secondly, we're seeing, and this is profoundly affecting US politics, but I think it also, it, it has echoes in Europe. 
we're seeing a very big geopolitical shift. You know, the, 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 the second half of the 20th century was the US dominated world. Um, and now we're seeing, you know, the, the rise of an increased swagger of an authoritarian China, which is changing the US's perception of its role, of its sense of, of, of um, vulnerability. And thirdly, we are, thanks to um, both change, social changes, civil rights changes, and increased immigration, we're seeing very big demographic shifts in, across advanced economies. And you know, the, the many countries in Europe have, have, have their highest share of immigrants as a share of the population than they've had in decades. Um, big changes here too, changes in the role of women, changes, you know, big, big changes, which are, you know, all of which I would welcome as a good, as a, as a good liberal, but I think have meant that the sort of, the nature of society, the nature of work, um, the sense of what the future brings has changed a lot. And if you are a less skilled, particularly a less skilled man, for whom the 20th century um, who did very well in the 20th century with stable, you know, manufacturing jobs. Uh, it's now, a, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a scary world out there. And there's a sense in the aftermath of the financial crisis that capitalism isn't working for many as it should be. And you put all of this together, you have, I think, a very powerful set of forces that make for people to feel, you know, concerned about the future, concerned about where the world is going, worried about them that they're not being listened to. And I think it's very telling. You know, there's, there's a, and I don't, don't remember the organization, but there is a poll that is done across countries about whether people feel that their kids will have a better future, a better life than they did. And, in, you know, across the Western world, the p percentages of people who say that you answer that positively has been declining. Um, and I think that makes for very fertile ground for a sort of big shakeup to the status quo, both sort of geopolitically, but within countries too. So, and I think that isn't gonna stop. We're at the beginning of that, um, which and I, in, in some way, and this sounds sort of, um, with respect, very political science-y, I didn't mean it to be, but it sounds, it sounds kind of more highfalutin than I'm, I mean it to be, but I, I think Brexit is, a, is in some ways a manifestation of that. 2016 was a manifestation of that here. You, you, you see different manifestations in different different countries, but the underlying deep shifts are ongoing, which makes me think that post-Brexit, Britain is not going to go back to the status quo ex ante, just as I think, you know, post-2020, we aren't going to go back to the US uh, as we knew it before either. Um, so I, I, I in, in some ways, you can be very pessimistic about that, and you say it's the end of the global world order, it's the end of this, it's the end of that. It's a period of turmoil and change, much as we had a period of turmoil and change at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. Um, there are some, you know, I don't want to push that parallel too far because there's some very terrible things that happened then. But, and World War II. And the yeah, no, and, and I'm, I, one, <laughs> one, I'm not for a second suggesting that anything like that is inevitable, but I do think we're in a period where the nature of the social contract, the nature of capitalism, the nature of um, the sort of relationship between the market and the state is going to change. And that is a profound challenge to existing political parties as they kind of grapple with it. Terrific. I'm about to open it up to you all, but I want to ask you one more question. And that context provides a really good backdrop, I think, for this. Coming back to Brexit, can you imagine a positive scenario um, if the UK uh, exits the EU in which that's a relatively successful outcome? Yeah, I can. Um, or I can imagine something that appears to be much less bad than people are um, <laughs> predicting. And, and let me, you know, there, there are various times. One is the sort of, you know, how big will the short-term dislocations be? You know, will we have black critical medicines? How long will the queues be at the border? You know, the, the sort of, this, the kind of stuff that, that, that I was written about on the front pages of newspapers a lot and that you know, brings out the kind of blitz spirit in, in Brits. Um, I'm sure that stuff will eventually get fixed. Um, for me, the bigger loss from moving out of a market of 500 million people is that it will have other things equal, you know, a long-term hit to Britain's productivity. Um, it is just not going to be able, possible to replace that with equivalently um, tight trade links with others, given 
geography and given where our markets are. So I, you know, I, I, I think it's a bad idea to do it. But if we're going to do it, um, I think if you look at the rest actually of, of Boris Johnson's economic package, which is in the short term, lots of money for infrastructure, big fiscal boost, um, basically the Tories have thrown fiscal caution to the wind and are promising to spend, spend, spend. That will, in the short term, give the economy a boost, which actually may mean that in the, in the short term, the hit is less obvious than people were expecting. Um, and so I can imagine a narrative this, you know, what were all these Ramonas fretting about? It wasn't nearly so bad. You know, it's okay. Life's gone on. We've done it. Um, and, and that, you know, that's, that's perfectly possible. It's, you know, I, I still think it, we would be better um, not to be doing that. Um, but I think you can certainly construct a situation where the impact is less dramatic than, you know, the doomsayers have predicted. The real, the real kind of wha double whammy would be if we crash out and we then vote in a Corbyn government. Then, then we've really, you know, then an unconstrained socialism Corbyn, in one country. Yeah, I mean, it depends. What, Corbyn and coalition would be different because it would be, but a Corbyn, an unconstrained Corbyn government that could do everything they're talking about doing. That, that would be a pretty fundamental shift. I tried to get us to the audience on an optimistic note, but <laughs> we've got what we've got. Um, let me um, turn it to you all, and please wait for a microphone to come so that we can all hear you. Please. So, Karen Kane, thank you so much for your great comments. I wonder if you would handicap the countries of the European Euro Union. Who wins and who loses Brexit in or out? In absolute terms, everybody, I think, is worse off. I think the Europe, Britain is worse off, and I think the European Union is worse off without us, which may increasingly not be something that, that people believe within the, within the rest of the European Union. But let me explain why. I actually think the European, Britain's role in the EU has been to be the voice of free markets, of free trade, of openness. Britain was the driving force behind the creation of the single market. Without Britain, I think the center of gravity moves towards France and Germany. And France, in particular, is, is naturally much more skeptical of free trade, naturally much more regulatory, naturally much less of a sort of deregulated free market place. So I think the EU without Britain is not just economically smaller, but it is much more likely to follow policies that are less conducive to growth than it would otherwise. So I think the EU is worse off than without Britain, let alone in, I mean, we've, that's a very economically based argument. In geopolitical terms, we're worse off because we, you know, contrary to what we think, we, we are simply a mid-sized country. Um, we're not a global power. Uh, and the EU is worse off because we are nonetheless a um, you know, reasonably important part, particularly in sort of geopolitical terms. So I would say everyone is worse off in relative terms you know, I think France has been rather adeptly under Emmanuel Macron taking up a leadership role within Europe. Uh, it's always the Franco-German bicycle that powers Europe. And right now, Germany is looking in the sort of twilight of the Angela Merkel era, not quite clear what replaces it. I think Germany is looking weaker relatively and France is looking more ascendant. So I guess handicapping on a relative basis, the French do better. But on an absolute basis, everybody is worse off than they would be, would have been. So I want to get a question from um, online, which is a media question right in your wheelhouse. Um, it says, has the UK media, the Economist accepted, done its people a disservice? Does the US, Eurosceptic press in the UK explain why British attitudes to the EU differ so greatly from others? Um, I certainly um, am leery of, you know, throwing mots in whatever, whatever the, the, the phrase is of, of criticizing others in the media, but I think the questioner is absolutely onto something. I think the British tabloid media has played a role in this. Um, and I think the, the kind of, you know, it's, it's effectively sort of base propaganda um, that has come out of that, has been a very big part of propagating the idea that you could have your cake and eat it, propagating the kind of them and us idea, allowing um, you know, oxygen to and, and support behind the absolute you know, lies and nonsense that was coming about you know, 
there would be, you know, Turkey would join the EU and hundreds and you know, millions and millions of Turks would suddenly arrive in Britain and all these, these shibboleths that became part of the debate. So yes, I do think that the tabloid media has a, has a big role to answer for, but you know, just as frankly, I think cable news is absolutely toxic to this country's political discourse. Terrific, right here please in the front. I want to go back to your prediction that there is a scenario where Brexit is not that bad. Is Europe cheering for such a scenario? Because I'll go back to the days of the height of the financial crisis, whether it was Greece or Italy or Spain. You saw the Germans and Schäuble even admitting to, I want to be especially uh, harsh with austerity measures to make sure nobody treats us, nobody tries this again. If the UK, if Brexit goes off and it's not that bad, does that incentivize an Italy or, you know, an alternative for Germany or Le Pen? It's a, it's a really interesting question. It's certainly one that um, was a, quite a big part of the discourse right after the referendum. You know, the Europeans couldn't allow this, the argument went, they couldn't allow this to be good for Britain because otherwise everyone would want to do it. I actually think the last three years have been so painful for British politics that I can't imagine anybody, any other country, thinking this is a great course to go down. Um, but I think there, is, there are different interests in, within Europe. There's certainly an uh, overwhelming desire not to be blamed by history for pushing the Brits out. I do think that's a large part of it. I think there's also a sense of well, if they're going to go, let's make sure you know my country gets the you know best bit of what they used to do. So there's a sort of you know the scramble between the you know Paris, Amsterdam, Frankfurt for who gets you know the most bit of financial services that are being forced to the EU is is very much a kind of I want it. Um, uh, there's what there's too little of in my view is a you know big picture over the horizon strategic sense that actually Britain is, uh, that Europe is worse off if Britain doesn't do well. It's, it's not in Europe's interest to have an angry, economically non-functioning country on their, on their you know, periphery. We're too big to, to kind of be forgotten about. Um, it's, Europe would, would be better off with Britain prospering. And, there, and so, but I don't see a huge evidence, and I can understand it because we've been a nightmare to negotiate with in the last three years, but I don't see a huge amount of um, sort of, you know, let's think about what kind of a Europe we want to have in 10 years time or 20 years time from the Europeans. And there's certainly not very much of that in Britain either. So I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm not kind of casting aspersions. I don't think, I think we have behaved in a manner that is very, very difficult to deal with. But I also think that there's a lot of sort of short-termist, you know, rigid, rigidity in the European position as well. And, and history, I suspect, will look back on both sides and say this was unbelievably badly handled. Um, yes, right here at the second. So it's a political science kind of question, my apologies. Um, <laughs> you very properly described the hollowing out of the center in Britain and most liberal democracies across the world. If you are planning to create a new center, what political agenda can you think of for both Britain and Europe, and God forbid America, where you can find enough traction politically to create that center and make it the pivot? That is a really, really good question. And um, the honest answer is I don't know. And I think that it's quite difficult to know what it is because that's why there is no that, that it's, it's not for lack of people recognizing and lamenting the lack of a center and thinking about what it would, what, what that would need to be. Uh, it's, I suspect, I mean, if, if, if I was sort of, you know, tabula rasa and I could kind of put things together, I, my own view is that it has to be a, a kind of reinvigorating of the social contract for the 21st century. It has to be a reinjecting of the competition into capitalism. It has to be a, and I think one area that is, and this is the big difference with the late 19th century, because that was it was not an issue then. One area is, ha is one possible area to come around is climate change, which I think is going to be certainly for the next generation a galvanizing issue, coming up with um, market-based but socially focused answers, being willing to be 
kind of radical enough to shake things up, but not trying to turn the clock back to 20th century socialism, but kind of building something that is a 21st century social contract. So I think the, 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 the ingredients are there. Emmanuel Macron is going some direction in that. You know, France had a huge, you know, it, it was, come, it, it had so, has so much to do that he's a long way from remaking a, a sort of a new consensus. But one thing that gives me, and you, you want some optimism, let me give you some optimism. Um, the one thing we have historically in the UK been quite good at is um, being in the vanguard of political economy revolutions. Um, we did it with the sort of remaking of liberalism, English liberalism in the early 20th century. Um, you know, we came up with the basics of the welfare state in sort of the 1907, 1910 budget, the very, very beginning. Then in the aftermath of World War II, you know, in a different direction, but the, the birth of the National Health Service, you know, the Attlee government, we again remade the sort of sense of what the state should do. And then with Margaret Thatcher, in 1979 and the kind of the Thatcher revolution, which then had echoes, you know, much of which um, had echoes here in this country, we were in the vanguard of that. You know, privatization was born in Britain or something that we then exported all over the globe. I think it is possible that we will, post-Brexit, once again, in over the next decade or so, we may lurch to the left for a bit, but if we do that, we'll eventually we'll realize that that won't work. But we will, we could be the country that actually is in the vanguard of what a new 21st century centrism looks like. That's my optimistic. And then we can export it everywhere else. This is, so this question online uh, doesn't keep the optimistic theme going. <laughs> um, but it does ask the question, what kind of country will be charting the future? And the question is, if Brexit happens, will Scotland hold an independence referendum? Will the UK stick together if Brexit happens? A very, very good question. I think it, ha it, it depends on the terms upon which it happens. So is it a negotiated withdrawal deal um, or is it some kind of crash out? And it, happen it depends most importantly on what happens thereafter. And particularly if we have a Corbyn government propped up by the Scottish nationalists, um, there's a very clear quid pro quo in their support for Jeremy Corbyn, which will be to demand another referendum on, Scot on Scottish independence. And the direction that referendum goes in will depend on the state of, in large part, on the state of the British economy and how Britain seems to be doing. And if Britain is in a disastrous state, then I think it makes the odds of, of Scot the Scots voting to leave much higher. I also think it's not just Scottish independence. I think how we handle the Irish issue um, over, say, a 10-year horizon will determine whether we move towards you know, a united Ireland or not. And I think it's not at all inconceivable that, I mean, this is really gloomy, but it, it's not at all inconceivable that we end up, you know, that the union basically breaks up and we end up with little England. And I, that would be a, you know, from, from my perspective, a, a very unfortunate outcome. It's not, it's, um, just to be clear, I'm not, it's not necessarily going to happen, but it is certainly at stake. Good, let me come back out to the um, audience again, right here. And Thank you. I wonder how much of this disengagement from Europe has already taken place. It's been three years, how much disinvestment, how much shifting of focus of business and financial markets away from London to uh, uh, the continent has taken place. And um, if, it, if this has happened, Assuming Britain stays in the EU, can this uh, Humpty Dumpty be put back together again? So it's, it's a really good question, and uh, the answer is it's sort of it's it's not quite clear. If you look simply at the number of um, financial sector jobs that have moved out of London, it's actually remarkably few thus far, um, because London has huge advantages. London is a wonderful city. Um, you know, with all due respect to Frankfurt, there's no comparison. <laughs> And so, you know, pe people want to live in London and, and financial service employers, you know, don't want to move people if they have to. Um, so there has actually been relatively little thus far. There hasn't been the sort of huge exodus. In terms of British manufacturing, which is where supply chains are completely linked up and so forth, you, you do, you've seen it definitely in terms of investment foregone. I mean, the rate of investment in the UK has clearly been hit by Brexit and, you know, Lots of big car companies have, you know, made investment decisions which 
have gone a different way than they might have gone if we hadn't had Brexit or if, if this hadn't been going on. So there's, we've been hit, but I think there's still quite a lot more to go because for a lot of um, you know, small and medium-sized British businesses, many of them have links to Europe because of the single market. And they're, you know, they're, they're small businesses and they aren't able to spend millions and millions of pounds or hundreds of thousands of pounds preparing Brexit plans. And so they've just said, look, this is, you know, they cross their fingers and hope that it would be sorted out. But if there is a, a crash out, I think there will be a knock on, a substantial knock on effect for those companies. In terms of, you know, what happens, can, can we rewind the clock? Probably not straight away, but I think in the end, what, what matters is whether, first of all, what, what our ultimate trading relationship ends up being with, the, with the Europe. So if it is broadly a free trade deal or as close to the single market as possible, then the impact will be you know, very, very small. What does the British economy look like? That's where I got my positive scenario from. If you actually have a lot of investment in British infrastructure, you have a lot of money flowing into the British economy, you could actually see investment coming up again. You know, we're quite cheap now. The, 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 as, you, as you know, if you go to London, I mean, the pound has fallen. We've, that's been the single biggest consequence of this. We are substantially poorer. Pound is way lower than it was. And so in many ways, we're an attractive destination. We're, it's, it's a flexible labor force. It's all of the things that it always was that on the, on the periphery of Europe. If we then actually have a sort of, you know, a, a broadly sensible economic policy, we could still be an attractive investment destination. Terrific. Let me go to the back of the room right over here. Uh, hello, Mark Anderson. Great program. I understand there exists a military union in the EU that Britain is a part of, or British military assets are a part of it, and that a lot of EU laws and regulations have been embedded in the British legal code. Is it possible that you could have a Brexit on paper but everything is so inextricably wound together that it would never really all the way happen. On the military side, or um, I, I think there are some areas that um, you will want to maintain, both sides will see it in their interest to maintain as close a links as possible, but the, the EU is a rules-based organization and all of these links have been built up on the basis of us being a member state of the EU, as a result of which certain legal obligations and rights come. If we're no longer a member, then you know, that, is, that is ended. And so we have to kind of rebuild those links. Um, and that will take an enormous amount of time. And how easily it's done depends on whether there is willingness to negotiate that and willingness to work on it on both sides. And that, in turn, I think, depends on the terms of our departure. So if we, if we have a negotiated withdrawal um, where this is done over you know, many years and there's, there's a transition period and all the things that were in the withdrawal agreement that Theresa May negotiated or, and could be indeed if there's an agreement made with Boris Johnson now, then I think this stuff becomes you know, the, the work of many bureaucratic hours, but that's really what it becomes. The, the problem with us flouncing out the, the, the kind of crash out scenario, is that just from a legal perspective, thousands of things that were automatically part of UK law because we were a member of the EU and vice versa, just doesn't hold overnight. And so it's, and it's going to happen in an environment of mutual recrimination and, and anger. And then I think that's when you have the, the dislocation in the short term, but also the political difficulty of rebuilding this stuff. So you're right, many areas, we will want to maintain those links, and the Europeans will also want to maintain those links, but they will have to be rebuilt because we will, it's a very legalistic organization, the European Union. I mean, they're, they're, you know, it, 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 it follows rules. And if you're not a member state, you'll treat it in a very different way than if you are a member state. And if, you, and, and if that happens overnight from the 31st of October to November 3rd, or 1st, or the end of January to the beginning of February, it's it's just I think this is this is easily forgotten. There's the sort of it, the the laws that were apt one day will no longer be applicable the next day, and you can have temporary extensions, and you can have this and that. But there's an all kinds of things that have to be put in place that haven't yet been put in place. Yeah, right here, please, Lisa. Thank you. Um, what happens if there's another referendum and the outcome is different 
the vote is to remain. What happens to Britain's relationship with the EU? How is that changed? Because I can't imagine that it's exactly the way it was before the first referendum. There has to be some it's a modification. Really good question. So what, what does that relationship look like? Um, it's a very good question. The answer is no one really knows. I think it depends, and, and the sort of parallel question is what does it do to British politics? And the, I think much, were we to have another referendum, much would depend on the margin of victory. If it was 52, 48 the other way, we are in a huge pickle. Um, because that is not decisive at all. If it was 65 to remain, 35 to leave, that would settle it in, in a much more um, credible way. In terms of uh, would we be able to go back to the sort of status quo ex ante with the Europeans, um, I think the, the honest answer is legally yes, in practice no. I mean, in pra you know, and I don't want to push the divorce analogy, but if you've got very, very close to getting divorced and you've decided not to, something has changed. Um, and I think that, that would be the, uh, there would be something of that. And I, I don't know how that would play out, whether, you know, but I actually, I expect the domestic consequences would be what would consume Britain in the short term after a referendum. So the, the, a very narrow referendum result either way would, would, be, would be very problematic. Right here, right back up here. Sorry, back over there on table seven, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just curious how you think history will judge Theresa May. Will she be the prime minister that was dealt an unwinnable hand in extraordinary times? or the prime minister that you know, failed to provide the required vision and leadership in a time of need? That's a really good question. And I think it depends on what happens in the next few months. If Boris Johnson is successful uh, in getting a deal, say, or in us leaving and the outcome not being perceived to be disastrous, then I think the view certainly amongst um, Tories will be she did it and look, it wasn't so bad and we just needed someone who was decisive and got on with it. If uh, it ends up being a crash out and a catastrophe and an election and Jeremy Corbyn's in power or any of those, that sort of constellation, there will be a kind of, she actually came up with something, why didn't we vote for it? She was dealt an impossible hand, as you say, but she made the best of it. She was not, a, you know, no one, I don't think any, I don't think we're going to get enough revisionist history that will suddenly decide she was, you know, the most charismatic of prime ministers. <laughs> but she will have been seen as someone who, who tried hard to get something. And, and so the perspective will be very much colored by where, where Britain is and what, how Britain feels about itself. Terrific. Let's come right here to table five. Thanks very much. Um, from another point of view, I wonder what the main players in the UK are thinking that the United States should do, could do, should not do, could not do to help the UK should things emerge that they're not part of it? Well, I think there are um, different views amongst players in the UK. There's clearly a, a um, you know, it's, it's very clearly part of the Prime Minister's game plan that um, a, to try and secure a trade deal with the US as fast as possible after Brexit. Um, uh, I think, and this is, I mean, you, you will all know much better than me, but I think there is insufficient attention placed in the UK on two things. Firstly, that any trade deal, even if it were negotiated, has to get through Congress. <laughs> Um, and that I find that hard to see how that happens in the very short term. And secondly, the relationship to the Good Friday Agreement. And I think that if there is, it was very telling when Speaker Pelosi came to the UK and basically said, if you guys rip up the Good Friday Agreement, there ain't gonna be trade deal. And she said it in a much more diplomatic way than that, but, but broadly. And I suspect that is something that is, is truer than people realize, that the, the relationship, the importance attached in sort of segments of US politics to what happens in Ireland. Um, others, you know, I think there are many people 
in the UK who lament the loss of US leadership in, and the lack of engagement. And it's, it, it's, you know, it's one thing to be cheering on Brexit. It's another, um, which is clearly what some elements of US politics are doing. Uh, but there isn't a sort of huge amount of engagement in, in between the US and Europe in any sort of strategic sense right now. And I think many people lament that and think that it would be, you know, in the same way that they lament the sort of lack of American engagement across a broad, broad area of the international system. So I don't think there's a single British view. Um, there's clearly one element which wants to get a trade deal as a sort of clear manifestation of a relationship very fast. And uh, there are others who, for whom um, you know, Britain's, Britain's role as uh, you know, the so hard, you know, geographically clearly closer to the rest of Europe, but, but traditionally you know, very close relationship with the US, but also very close and part of the European Union. That was a, that was a pretty good place for Britain to be. Um, and I think we sort of lament both sides of that. Well, Zanny, I just want to thank you so much for coming here. I think you've done a tremendous job, not only helping us understand what happens in the next 30 days, <laughs> but how to think, as you point out, the game's not over no matter what happens at the end of this month, but how to think about and understand what will continue to unfold. And you certainly have armed all of us with fascinating conversations we can take uh, <laughs> into dining rooms and cocktail parties all weekend. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.